in this lecture, we're going to look at shutter speed and the effect that has on things that are moving in your photos. It's nothing like as long or involved as the previous lecture on aperture because it's pretty obvious really. The longer the shutter is open, the more things can move, the more you get movement blur and so on. But you might still pick up a few interesting little tips. And don't forget, this whole section is also covered in our course notes booklet that you can buy online and also those little plastic summary clip cards as well. There's a section there on you know using shutter speed to freeze or show movement and how you do all that kind of stuff. So what is shutter speed? Well, as you know, it's just how long that shutter is open for, how long the light is allowed to shine onto the sensor for. So if you use a very quick shutter speed, then nothing's had a chance to move anywhere while the photo is being recorded. So you end up being able to snap freeze even quite fast subjects like these ones. You know, it's worth knowing that almost all of your cameras should be able to do four thousandth of a second. You can all snap freeze photos like this if you know how to control it properly. And slow shutter speeds, on the other hand, show movement blur. So anything that's moving becomes streaked across your image and you can create some really beautiful effects. Incidentally, sports mode. If your camera has a sports mode, one of the things that sports mode tries to do is give you a nice fast shutter speed so you don't have blurry people running around. But the problem with all of these basic modes are that you can't change anything yourself. So sure, it might try and give you a fast shutter speed, but what if you wanted to brighten the photo with your exposure compensation or you know, use a different autofocus point or something. You can't do any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, they're incredibly limiting modes to be in. You may as well be in aperture or shutter speed mode over on the creative side, and you can do all of these things and more in any of these modes. Here's a photo of a waterfall taken in auto mode. And for whatever reason, the camera thought that 50th of a second would be about right. Now, 50th of a second is not particularly quick or particularly slow. So we haven't frozen the waterfall or shown that nice flowing movement. But if instead we ask for a one second photo, then now you can see that lovely flowing cascade effect that looks so beautiful in waterfalls. There's a lot of situations where showing a bit of movement in your photo can really just add a bit of life. You know, if you take a fast photo of a helicopter, normally you end up with a really fast shutter speed and the blades are just frozen there in midair and it kind of looks like the engine's turned off and it should just be falling out of the sky. But if you allow just enough shutter speed that the blades can turn a little bit, it just looks more natural, like the engine's still going. Most low light photography has to be quite long slow photos just because it takes a long time for the camera to get enough light in there to record the image. But this is some of the most beautiful creative photos you can do I think. Like this one, 6 seconds, so obviously the camera has to be absolutely motionless. So ideally on a tripod or at least sitting on a rock or something where you don't have to touch it. But not only does the camera have to be motionless, of course your subjects do as well. And you can see actually she has moved so she's blurry there but it would have been alright. This one, 20 minutes, so now we're getting beyond the 30 second limit that the camera can do by itself. So to get this kind of shot, you've got to plug in some external timer. So after 20 minutes, obviously the Earth has started to rotate and the stars get dragged past the sky there and beginning to get a bit of a star trail. But it's cool to see the star trail is not actually a straight line, is it? It's a bit of a curve. And if you can work out where the center of that set of circles are, you get a photo like this one. So to work out where that point is, where all the stars are spiraling around, in the northern hemisphere, it's a bit easier. There's a giant star there called the North Star. And if you can recognize that, easy. In the southern hemisphere though, it's a bit more complicated, but you can work it out from the Southern Cross. So if you find that constellation and you just draw a line down through the middle of the Southern Cross, like a string coming down from the kite. And if you just extend the axes of the Southern Cross down by about four and a half times the height of the Southern Cross. So you just kind of go, there it is. One, two, three, four and a bit. That's the same point. That's where it's all spiraling. So you can put that somewhere, you know, for good composition in your shot. And also if you're lost and you're trying to work out where south is, find that point and then directly down the nearest bit of horizon straight underneath, that'll always be due south. So that might come in handy as well. We've actually got a whole lot of really good tutorials on our website, including one on star trails. It's quite popular. They look quite long, these tutorials, but it's just because I've worded them in a way that they're really easy to understand and they, they don't assume any prior knowledge. So it goes through everything, like what lenses are you going to use and how do you focus because it's in the dark. What are the common problems you might come up against, like a plane? What are your different ways of being able to do it? You could do one really long exposure or you could do a whole lot of short ones and then stitch them together using free software. There's a whole lot of different options out there and it's really worthwhile having a look at these free tutorials. So go to the website crisprayphotography.com and have a look there, there's so many different tutorials. Now longer, slower shutter speeds, they give you time to be a bit more creative with light and come up with some really cool photos. Like this one, it's a photo of someone walking through the snow carrying a torch. You can't really see the person in the photo because they've kind of smeared themselves across the whole image, but the torch was bright enough that wherever it went, it really left a mark on the sensor. This was our Christmas card photo a couple of years back, so there's no fancy Photoshop or anything going on here. It's just a 10 second photo with a flash at the end of it. So initially all the camera can see is just black, and then the sparkle is right, merry, 
Xmas, and then we stand to the side and then a flash goes off and fills us in there. It's pretty cool what you can do with these kind of things. Or this one, you can tie a light to a string and spin it around while you walk in a circle and you end up with a light orb. Looks pretty cool. You can draw pictures just in free space. You just use these little torches, draw shapes or symbols and then the reflection there is because we've done it on a, a wet beach. And if you haven't tried a photo like this one before, you really have to, it's great fun. It's actually steel wool. You wouldn't think steel wool would burn, but it just sort of smolders a little bit. But if you tie it onto a bit of string and spin it around, absolutely it burns. And it just sends these beautiful shards of molten metal up in these wonderful arches and it just looks amazing. Um, you've got to be careful though. Um, there's a few tips you probably don't want to learn by trial and error. Like uh, some of the bits of steel wool go straight up in the air and come down and land in your hair. So good plan to wear a hat. And best not to just tie the steel wool directly onto the string because otherwise you'll find part way through it just burns through and you just send this burning meteor onto your neighbor's roof. That's not good. Uh, you're better off actually using a bulldog clip, clipping the bulldog clip onto the steel wool and tying the string onto the bulldog clip. Yeah, a few little tips like that that might just save you a little bit of embarrassment. We also have a light painting tutorial on the website and that just goes through all about how to take these long slow exposures where you can draw things with the light, like the light orbs or drawing pictures or the steel wool. So you have a read through that as well and have some fun. Well, what about this photo of the glowing tent? Now as much as MSR would like us to believe that tents are wonderfully warm glowing havens, you know, they're not. They're miserable, cold, horrible, wet, dark places. But to make it glow like that, you've just got to do whatever you can do in 30 seconds with light. So I've actually just dived inside the door of the tent there. You can still see my legs hanging out. And the little white lines in there, that's just me waving the torch around, trying to give it an even spread of light from the inside. But the thing about all of these low light photos, you can't even begin to do them unless you have a tripod. And I think that's the main reason why it's worth going and getting a tripod. It just opens up this whole world of photography for you. Don't get an enormously giant heavy one, you know, lots of people have that, but they just never take it with them anywhere. Get one that's small enough that you can be bothered to take it with you. When you're buying a tripod, I'd consider getting one that's with a ball head, that's nice and easy, easy to move around. You know the old ones where you have to kind of adjust one lever this way and then some other adjustment here to go vertically and it's quite awkward to use. A ball head is what I like where you just undo one thing and you can point it wherever you want, lock it, and then it's nice and quick. And all tripods have a load limit that they're designed to support. So you've got to make sure your tripod is strong enough to support your, your camera and your heaviest lens. But don't go and buy one that can support 10 times as much because it's just too heavy and too expensive and you'll never bring it with you anyway. Now even if you've got a tripod, sometimes you'll find these long exposures are still blurry. And normally what's happened there is you poke the camera. It's you pressing the button that started the whole thing wobbling. So you could use some fancy timer remote so you can press it without bumping the camera, but you're better off just using the inbuilt self timer you've got on your camera. You know that 10 second countdown, beep, 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 and then it takes a photo. If you're ever using your camera on a tripod, you may as well turn that delay on. It just means you can press the camera all you want and it'll wobble a little bit, but after 10 seconds, it'll be perfectly still and it'll take it for you. Also, it's a good idea if you're shooting on a tripod and you know everything is nice and stable, you should turn the stabilizer off on your lens because some stabilizers actually end up introducing camera shake if the camera is really steady. So turn that off. Just remember to turn it back on again afterwards. Let's have a look at the different drive modes you might have in your camera. So you either have a button that's called drive or a button that has these kind of symbols next to it or you'll find your way there. But you get options like these ones. Single shooting, that's what you normally want. That's when you press the button once and you get one picture. That's normal or you've got rapid fire, continuous shooting, high speed continuous, and that's when you hold your finger down and the camera just takes as many photos as it can, as quickly as it can, until you take your finger off. And that's good for a situation where there's something rapidly happening in front of you and you don't know quite when to get the perfect moment. So you just leave your finger down and get all of them and then go back and hopefully find the perfect moment in there somewhere. This one is a 10 second delay, the countdown timer. Normally good for with your friends so you can run around and stand and be part of the photo. But as I said, it's also good for if your camera's on a tripod to keep it nice and steady so it's not wobbling anymore by the time it actually takes the photo. Funny story getting this photo though up in the Arctic. So I didn't have any fancy timers with me or anything during that trip. All I had was 10 seconds to run around from behind the camera, pick up my hiking poles and pick up the harness and make it look like I just hauled the kayak up the hill. I actually had to take this photo seven times because the first couple of photos are of me just sprawled on the ground somewhere, slipped over, you know, it's just ice. When we actually finally got home, I did talk to Canon and say, why don't you make a variable time limit on these things, like out to a minute or, or longer, where you could calmly walk into the distance of your own photo? And they basically said, yeah, but then no one would buy any of our little timers, would they? But they did bring out the two second mode, which is actually five times less useful than the 10 second one. 
but I gather it's more useful for when the camera's on a tripod and you wanna press a button and step away, the camera will have stopped shaking after about two seconds. So it saves you a little bit of time. And yeah, I guess it's good for coastal exposures or something where you're photographing a wave coming over a rock. It's hard to predict 10 seconds out when the wave's gonna come. So two seconds are a little bit easier to use, but it's basically for when the camera's on the tripod. Some cameras have a self timer continuous mode like this one. It looks like a variable time limit, but it's not. You're still stuck at 10 seconds, but that's the number of photos it'll take after 10 seconds normally with a one second gap between them. So that's useful in a situation like this where maybe Jess can hang on to the bikes, I can set the camera up, press the button, run back, and then it'll take a bunch of photos as we slowly cycle towards, and then you can go back and pick the best one. Or more commonly useful for a group photo. You know, normally you take a group photo, then you have to run back and check, and then you find out that, you know, someone was blinking and you had to go back and do it again. So instead you could just tell it to do the 10 second delay, you run around, join your friends, and then it'll take a whole series of photos afterwards, and hopefully one of them everyone's eyes are open. Okay, let's have a look at time value mode, TV mode on a Canon or S mode for every other brand. And in time value mode, you can choose whatever shutter speed you want and the camera works out the aperture to go with it. It's just like the opposite of aperture mode. So you'd be using TV mode or S mode when getting a particular shutter speed is what's creatively most important to your photo. So maybe you, you really want a one second photo to get that waterfall, or maybe the most important thing is to have a four thousandth of a second photo to be able to freeze a bird or something like that. And it works just like you'd expect. You touch the button, the camera wakes up, and it starts with the last shutter speed that you used, and you can scroll around and pick whatever value you want. You can see here we're scrolling to slower and slower photos, and to prevent more light coming in, the camera is automatically using smaller and smaller holes for us at the same time. But you can see we're gonna run into the same kind of limit in the end, that the camera just can't make the hole any smaller after a while. So as we ask for longer and longer photos here, sixth of a second, 0.3 of a second, that seems to be okay. But if we try and go any further, you find the camera just can't shrink down that hole anymore, so it can't stop any extra light coming in. So then you're gonna get into that same situation we saw in the aperture lecture, where it just starts flashing warnings at you saying, you know, the value you're picking is inappropriate for the current lighting conditions. But again, it won't stop you taking the picture. So if you really wanted to, you could scroll all the way to 30 seconds or something during the day, take a picture and it will try and warn you. But if you ignore those warnings, it'll just take a full 30 second photo for you and it'll come back and it'll just be massively overexposed. So just watch out for those flashing warnings again. And just a reminder, you can always get to the same photo, exactly the same settings on any of these other modes, like aperture mode. It's just which variable do you want to make sure you keep at the same value. If you really want a particular shutter speed all the time, then you'd want to be in shutter speed mode. If the most important thing was to have a particular F number the whole time for a certain depth of field, then you'd stay in aperture mode. So some cool tricks with longer shutter speeds. The panning shot is a good one to practice. That's where you want to show movement in a subject but rather than just holding the camera steady and having a long shutter speed and letting your animal or your car or whatever it is move past, because that wouldn't look very good, you just end up with a blurry subject. Instead, you can actually follow the subject with the lens as it goes past, and if you can keep the, your subject in exactly the same part of the photo, it stays nice and sharp, but the background, click, becomes blurred and streaked past. It's a much nicer way of showing your subjects moving than having a blurry subject. Experiment with different settings, start off with about tenth of a second or twentieth of a second. So that's still fairly slow. And then just look through and follow it as it comes along. Click and take it when the animal or the car is right perpendicular in front of you. And you should end up with a pretty cool result. It's just practice. You'll get a lot better even in the first couple of times you try. The zooming in shot. Try and imagine what your photo would look like if you zoomed in while you were taking the picture. Kind of weird. Yeah, but it is kind of cool. It creates all these leading lines kind of pulling your attention into the subject, which can be a nice creative effect. Now for our shutter speed prac, what you want to do is just go outside and find something that's moving. You know, it could be a car driving past, it could be a friend walking back and forwards in front of you. Uh, ideally, it might even be a waterfall or a fountain. So then set your camera up on a tripod, ideally, and then wake it up. That's an important step. You've got to always remember to wake up your camera so that it's alert and looking at the lighting out there and stuff. Otherwise, you wouldn't know if it was trying to flash warnings at you or not. And then try and scroll down to the slowest shutter speed you can. So you wake it up, Scroll slower and slower, watching your shutter speed, and eventually you'll get so slow that it'll start to flash warnings at you. So then come back one, and then it should calm down. That's the longest, slowest photo you can take. So go ahead and take that one, click, and you probably see that shows the movement in the, in the fountain or the waterfall or the car going past. That'll show movement blur. And then take the same photo again, but now with a fast shutter speed. So you'd wake it up, and then go the other way, faster and faster. And then finally, it'll get too fast, it'll flash warnings at you, come back a bit, 
okay? Then that's the fastest photo you can take in that situation. So take it and you should find that the, the movement has been frozen or at least less movement has occurred. Now, because we haven't really covered ISO yet, that's in the next lecture coming up. For now, just put your ISO on a middle sort of value like ISO 400, that'll be fine. Mm.